This video is brought to you by Hover.com. Last time we discussed the attack on the Ketracel White facility, Cisco and crew had successfully destroyed it, but not before the soldiers on the base realized something was up and tried to stop them. This would result in the captured Jem'Hadar ship almost being destroyed. In the end, it would lose main power while being chased by other Jem'Hadar attack ships and try to get away in a nebula that was uncharted. Which is arguable if that was a good idea, as the end result is them plummeting onto a planet. Let's take a look at how soldiers are sold out so those who never see combat can live. With the ship crashing into the ocean, Sisko, O'Brien, Jadzia, Garrick, Bashir, Random Beautiful Redhead, Nog, and I'm sure no one else that we'll see slowly makes their way onto the shore. The vessel was definitively destroyed, as I've noted, and the survivors are barely able to get any supplies onto the beach. They would have no communication systems, and Jadzia was in pretty bad shape. However, things would get even worse as we find O'Brien's favorite lucky pants are torn. The situation would continue to become more and more dire. While Bashir states that he had fixed the internal damage, Jedzia would be in no condition to assist or fight, and it's possible, however unlikely, that the symbiont was hurt worse than Bashir is aware. The old young science officer would be out of commission and have to stare at the wall face for the rest of the episode. While the crew tries to figure out how to get out of this mess, we see them utilizing their training. Phasers to heat up rocks to dry clothes and keep them warm, as well as to create simple tools so that they can survive. They stay in good spirits by sharing random jokes here and there. Small things that really add to the story in my opinion. To be fair, it's worth noting that Starfleet personnel have no idea that they are sharing a planet with stranded Jemadar. Due to this, they seem more lax. This is observable when Nog and Garrick go to look for vegetation and water so that they can survive. Their interactions, the way they're walking, feels less regimented. And while they do have phasers, they aren't really prepared for the worst. I honestly don't know how to feel about this, if I'm being honest. While they may not realize the Jem'Hadar are there, they are in Dominion space. It's possible that a base is here, especially if it's in a region that Starfleet hasn't cataloged. The fact they don't know anything about this place would make it a great spot to hide a facility. Or, if we assume the Dominion aren't here at all, there are still other things, like animals and beasts, that can hurt or kill you. So to not be more concerned about safety is disconcerting. That said, Starfleet not preparing for the worst in bad situations if the threat isn't right in their faces isn't out of the norm, so good consistency. On that topic, I'll also take a moment to discuss the back and forth between Nog and Garrick. Nog insists that Garrick stay to his side or in front of him. This due to a previous episode where Garrick, after becoming drugged, had tried to kill Nog and others. Long story. The reason I point this out is just because I like the continuity. It's really nice. For Nog's part, it's also very relatable. Even though Nog knows Garrick wasn't himself, Nog can't let go of what happened and thus doesn't trust him. Ironically, Garrick would find this admirable. Unfortunately, they wouldn't get far as the duo is taken prisoner by the Jem'Hadar and escorted to a hurt Vorta. Garrick initially tries to lie his way out of it, saying he was a part of the Cardassian Intelligence Bureau, also known as the Obsidian Order, but was captured by the USS Centaur. Unfortunately, the Vorta is a bit smarter than that, pointing out that Garrick had a comm badge and then asking if they had a doctor. Garrick, realizing the importance of the question, answers honestly. They would be held prisoner and Jim Hadar dispatched to find the rest of the Starfleet encampment. Now here's a question. Did Garrick give away the location of Sisko and his crew knowing it was their best chance to survive, or did the Dominion find them on their own? I honestly don't know. Presumably, the Jim Hadar had scanning equipment, so it's hard to be sure of which is true. Though, during their interrogation, back at the Starfleet camp, a guy in a yellow shirt that we've never seen before, and will just accept has always been there and probably won't be used as a prop later, states that Nog and Garrick haven't reported back in and aren't responding to communication attempts. The Starfleet officers now leave with phaser rifles, again something that just magicked into air and we don't see till now, looking for their lost comrades. They would utilize a tricorder and detect life forms. 
Apparently, the tricorders can't determine if it's the Jem'Hadar or not. Even though we know they can specifically detect Jem'Hadar lifeforms in both previous episodes and future ones. I guess it's just tough luck having the one cute redhead that can't read a tricorder. The captain orders that the personnel split up to make it harder to be hit if they come under attack. And come under attack they would as the Jem'Hadar fire on them and in the middle of the combat, for what feels like no reason, the Dominion soldiers begin providing cover fire while the others withdraw. This would confuse O'Brien and the others as the Starfleet personnel questioned why they didn't just camouflage. After the attack, Sisko would make preparations to defend the base while a Jem'Hadar approaches their position. We'll get into that conversation after this very long fracking ad that took me a lot to make, so watch it! <laughs> I love being a stand-in for a television CEO. Ah, yeah, just an innocuous CEO that isn't anyone specific at all. Known for all my sci-fi star-related series, yes. <sighs> oh, look! One of my favorites is calling me. <sighs> Hello? Hey, it's me. We got a problem. What is it, my minion? Have we finally overthrown the U.S. government so that anyone who tried to do fair use is killed? No, no. Worse than that. Then whatever could it be? Will we not be able to punish our employees and eat puppies? No, even worse than that. What could be worse than an executive of CBS not be... I mean, an innocuous television CEO not being able to eat puppies, punish his employees, and kill those who use fair use. Lore Reloaded now has a sponsorship. He's being sponsored by Hoover. Why would a vacuum company want to sponsor him? I don't even get it. You idiot! Hover.com is one of the premier registrar websites in the United States and around the world. If you want a website, it is Hover.com you go to. Whether you're making websites as a hobby, doing it for a friend, or need something more professional for your business, Hover.com has got you covered. They don't try to get you with gimmicks like programs to make you build a site, then try to sell you something every time you call in. Nor do they try to use sexy girls to get your attention. Well, obviously. Go to Hover.com forward slash lore reloaded to get 10% off your first purchase. Basically, they stick to what they do best. Website registration. Yeah, but what if somebody wants to talk about something that they disagree with? Ha! This isn't the Star Trek Discovery Writer's Room. This isn't just a random writer's room, you idiot. As long as you're not breaking the law or going to try to break the law, they let you do whatever you want, from feminist to men's rights, anything in between. Star Trek, Star Wars, it doesn't matter to them. You make what you want. They don't care. Uh, sir, how would you know about this amazing site and where they can go to get their discount from Lore Reloaded? Oh, my plump turtle dove. I'm a television CEO. This whole thing being in continuity or making any sense doesn't matter to me. Uh, sure. But what are we going to do about Lore? Don't worry, precious. We're going to have him killed. <laughs> I understand. As discussed, Sisko talks with a Jim Hadar. During this time, the captain attempts to sow discord between the Vorta and the soldier. While it seems to work a bit, ultimately the Jim Hadar doesn't listen to him. The brainwashed man states that their Vorta has offered to give back Garrick and Nog if Sisko and the Doctor come to the Dominion camp. 
Sisko states that it's a trap and a bad trade. He asks if the Jemadar would accept it, who admits he wouldn't. Even after this bluster, though, the captain would agree to the terms, on the word of the Jem'Hadar, not the Vorta, that he and the Doctor would be able to be returned after all of this occurs. The trade-off is tense, but amical, Garrick giving the usual pleasantries when it's inappropriate. When they arrive to the camp, the Doctor would be asked to provide surgery upon the Vorta. It goes as planned, and the Vorta will be expected to make a full recovery. The slimy man would order all of the Jim'Hadar to leave and make a deal with Sisko. The Vorta states that they do not have enough white to sustain the Jim'Hadar, and that because of this, they must be eliminated or the Jim'Hadar will kill everyone. The Vorta states to prevent this occurrence, he is going to order all of the Jim'Hadar to attack the Starfleet base camp, though he will give all of the tactical information and where they're attacking from to Sisko. The agreement is for the Starfleet officers to kill all of the Jim Hadar, and then he will ultimately surrender with their damaged comm unit so that O'Brien can fix it. And they'll all get off the planet alive, which is a happy ever after if the Vorta ever saw one. While debating how best to kill the Jim Hadar, there would be a wonderful back and forth between Garrick and O'Brien. Garrick states that the plan they have is perfect because it doesn't give the Jim Hadar a chance. The Cardassian says, quote unquote, that this is the point. In case everyone's forgotten, they're in a war. O'Brien seems disgusted and states that there are rules, even in a war. Garrett counters quite exquisitely stating, correction, humans have rules in a war. Rules that make winning harder to achieve, in my opinion. The argument continues with some saying they need to be shot down because the Jem'Hadar wouldn't hesitate to do the same to them, and others countering that Starfleet has to be better than what the Dominion is. Sisko shuts it all down, saying that it wasn't a vote, it was his decision, and Garrick was right. Given the choice between the Dominion and them, there wasn't a choice. They're going to kill all the Jem'Hadar. Sisko meets with the third, the Jem'Hadar we've been seeing all this time, telling him that his men had been betrayed. The captain would offer to take all of them in, put them in stasis until they could secure some white. The Jem'Hadar would ultimately decline. Victory is life, after all. While this conversation is powerful, I'll admit that Sisko takes the wrong tact here. He relies on the fact that the Vorta double-crossed the Jem'Hadar, that he betrayed them and wasn't worth being followed as a reason not to go through with the plan. What Sisko doesn't understand, given that the Federation is likely largely secular, is that religious fervor and devotion doesn't require a plan making sense. It also doesn't require for the person to live for someone to believe it. Whether we talk in the Trek universe or real life, people will often do things that harm themselves because they believe that's what their god wants, or at least people that are higher than them in some hierarchy for their god wants. Instead of giving this argument, what Sisko should have done was explain how the Vorta was not just betraying them, but the Founders. As a prisoner of war, the Vorta will give Starfleet untold information that will harm the Founders in several ways. This, at least, would give the Jemadar a moment of pause. Of course, it's likely to backfire as the Jemadar may realize that he will get that anyway, plus a bunch of soldiers. Or the third might try to retreat to kill the Vorta so no one gets off alive. It would be a roll of the dice for sure. But to be honest, looking at it that way, the murder of the Jemadar was the best tactical decision for the war, given what they get from the Vorta. In the end, the Starfleet officers would mow down the Jemadar. Of course, they wouldn't use stun settings, because I mean, why would you do that when you can kill them, I guess? Even though we never see him get hit, Starfleet ultimately takes one casualty. And surprise, surprise, it was the random guy that appears with the yellow shirt. After this, the Vorta would walk among the dead, looking at the Jemadar corpses as if they were nothing, stating that he would have won if they'd had two more vials of light. Sisko would order a burial detail, giving honors to both sides, and ultimately everyone would be saved. Even though they were deep in Dominion space and a nebula not charted, but we'll just ignore that. Now, let's rewind and see this from the Jim Hadar's side. Let's take a look at what they saw. The situation with the Jim Hadar isn't as in depth, but is still different and interesting. From the onset, we're basically told who we can and cannot like. The third being wise and respected uh, against the Vorta, someone sleazier than Weyoun. Don't worry if you don't know who Weyoun is, it's one of those minor characters that only really big nerds like me are aware of. All of this would begin when the third disagreed with the Vorta and they entered into the nebula, and thanks to going in, the ship would crash land and the first and second would be killed. The third is dedicated to a fault to the Dominion and the Founders. 
As conditions get worse, and only one vial of white being given to ten men, it would be the third that has to keep all of them in line. Again, it would be increasingly difficult for the third as the men become harder and harder to control as they slowly succumb to not having enough white. Additionally, their shrouding ability was also somehow tied to the white and they lose it. Which is weird because when the others had no white in the episode Hippocratic Oath, they still appeared to be able to shroud, but whatever. The rest of the interactions occur as we see with the Starfleet officers, though I will say that I can't necessarily question the way the Dominion group was written. While part of me wants to rewrite the Vorta as I find him too slimy, too one-dimensional, I don't know that it's inconsistent with what we know of the Vorta nor how they would act. Additionally, sometimes black and white is the best way to go. Overall, what occurs in this episode can be considered pretty powerful. It shows you that the Jemadar are brainwashed brutes, but not all of them are stupid. Additionally, they do have a sense of honor, and this is something that we'll see throughout the series. The Jemadar have their own culture and their own way of doing things. We even see them attempt to strive to be better than what they are to be free. It makes conversations like these pretty interesting. But all of this is my opinion. What's yours? Besides your complaints about the long ad, I don't feel like it. Feel free to fully fund my Patreon if you don't like it. I mean, my God, people, I tried to do everything I can, and that ad took a couple of days to do, and I tried to make it entertaining, but do you care? No. No, you don't. I have to do all this for free and dance for you until I die.